today we'll, we'll be studying instantons in gauge theory. And we'll start with an exercise of sorts. We'll take the, uh, the space time to, oops, to be of the um, form of a product of a three manifold. And the timeline, let's say it's compact. And we'll try an ansatz. Uh, for the um, gauge field of the following simple form. So it will be, it's going to be some function of time. So time is the coordinate on, on the real line. Times uh, a connection. So theta is going to be flat connection on M3. So it means that it solves this equation. This is the derivative form of M3. So theta does not depend on time. The only uh, the time dependence is on in, this, in the scale factor. Uh, so if you, if you compute the curvature of this connection, it's going to be something like f dot dt h theta plus uh, f d theta plus f squared theta wedge theta, which you can rewrite using this equation as uh, in this form. So this is the only component which has time component, time direction, and this is purely uh, uh, space-like. So when you compute the young mills action with this ansatz, you'll get the integral over time and then some constant times uh, trace f dot squared. Uh, let me assume, actually, for simplicity, that f is a scalar function. So this is just simply <coughs> so it's just, um, and then uh, some other constant times uh, f squared f minus 1 squared. So this constants uh, know, know something about uh, this, this connection theta. So C1 is the integral over M3 of theta star theta. And C2 is the integral of uh, theta wedge theta wedge star theta wedge theta. Uh, so th I'd like to point out that this connection theta may be pure a pure gauge, uh, actually. In fact, for uh, if M3 is, let's say, three sphere, then, uh, th 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 then it has to be a, a flat connection. But it may be a flat connection with non-trivial uh, um, winding number. So, it, so, uh, so you can express these quantities uh, or you can actually estimate these quantities using uh, your third constant, which is the chan simons invariant, which is the integral of theta cube. Uh, I'm, I'm skipping some factors of 2 pi here. It's not important. Uh, and so if actually if I added a topological term, the integral of trace f by f, this will also appear. Um, at any rate, so for this ansatz, the action reduces to the one to the uh, you know classical mechanical action of a particle, so the particle coordinate is f, and what you can see is that this particle is moving in the potential of the kind which we studied yesterday. Ah, sorry. So this is the f coordinate, and this is the potential. So this potential looks like the pot one yes, except that it's shifted. 
So it's a double well potential. Uh, it has two minima. One is at f equals to zero. So a is, is, is trivial. And another is at f equals to one, where a is flat. And so uh, from yesterday, we know what the classical solutions look like. So the cl classical solutions which are in general complex will be the uh, rational windings of an elliptic curve which, is, uh, which corresponds to a complex f in general. But there is one solution which is uh, very easy to construct, namely it's the one which is, which is half, so sort of half of the full uh, periodic solution. So this is for periodic uh, uh, solutions where we replace R1 by S1. And, but if we don't replace it, so we consider uh, our, um, the timeline to be truly infinite, then there is a solution which is a tunneling between 0 and 1. And so that's a solution that will be solving the first order equation. F dot is proportional to F, F minus 1. So that's it. Uh, that's the, the instanton in the sense of quantum mechanics. And that's actually going to be the instanton which was discovered by uh, Belavin, Polyakov, Schwartz, and uh, Tupkin, Tupkin right. in uh, 1975, I believe, uh, but in a slightly uh, unusual form. So, so this is the BPS T instanton in radial coordinates. So what uh, Sasha Belavin et al. did, they, they were, of course, they were studying solutions of the, uh, well, they were studying self-duality equations. Today we will be replacing changing orientation, so it will be the other self duality equation on R4, uh, which uh, have uh, a rotational symmetry. Uh, actually, it's SO4 symmetry. Uh, with gauge group SU2. So here I slightly generalized, but if you, take, if you keep the gauge group to be SU2, and take, uh, so R4, if you write the metric in the radial in spherical coordinates, you see that this metric is actually kind of formally equivalent to the metric on, uh, on the direct product of S3 times the real line. So it's R, R squared times the R squared over R squared plus, so this is the round Uh, S3 metric, and uh, in the exercises you you're supposed to find that these equations are conformally invariant. So the solution of the equations on flat space is the same as solution of these equations on on that space. And now by going to the coordinate, which is a logarithm of of the radius, with now time changing from minus infinity to plus infinity, that becomes simply the metric on the product uh, R1 cross S3. And so the ansatz of uh, BPST corresponds to taking theta to be G inverse DG, where G is the map from S3 to SU2, which is simply the isomorphism. So the, when you identify the uh, group SU2 with the th three-dimensional sphere, so you can view it as a map which identifies the sphere in space with the group SU2, which is kind of isotopic uh, sphere. And uh, so the F, which you will get by solving this equation, I will not do it for you, you can, it's, it's a neat exercise, will precisely cor uh, correspond to the scale factor which BPST found. Of course, then you, uh, once you found the solution here and you map it here, you can produce more solutions by applying translational invariance 
and conformal transformations, and so that gives you the modular space of solutions. Uh, unfortunately, that method is hard to generalize to high instanton charges. So here, the instanton charge is the number of the number of times you tunneled between zero and one, which is only one. And if you look at the solutions which I described yesterday, they actually tunnel back and forth. So they, the net instanton charge for those solutions is zero. And so they correspond to the true uh, uh, smooth instanton, nine instanton configurations. But uh, today, I'm not going to be interest, interested in those. I want to generalize this construction and, and describe all all instanton <coughs> solutions on R4, which actually extend to to the conformal compactification of R4. So it's another conformal conformal story. Uh, so you could add one point. To, to R4 and produce uh, a force field topologically. And you can do some conformal rescaling of the metric uh, here to produce some uh, the sphere uh, isometrically. And so uh, the solutions which we, which we are interested in will extend to the four-dimensional sphere, which is compact and on which you can define the topological number. So we will be interested in, in, the, in, this, in the solutions of general charge, okay? Uh, and for the group SUN. So it turns out that the solutions can be described, uh, uh, well, more explicitly than, than naively you would think. So the equations which we're solving are partial differential equations, but it, it turns out that instead of solving the PDEs, you can solve uh, algebraic equations. On matrices. So this is known as the ADHM construction. Partia, Dreamfield, Hitchin, and Manning. Which in turn grew out of the study of twisters uh, and uh, inverse, uh, so actually, which in turn come go back to the inverse scattering method in integrable equations, Zahar of Shabbat and those techniques. So uh, the uh, so there are two ways. I can start by, by just stating the result, or I can try to motivate it. And let me try to motivate it a little bit. So the idea is, to, is that suppose you, you, have, you, have, you have an instanton, so a solution of this equation with finite action. Uh, then what you can do, you can study the Dirac equation. With, uh, uh, with spinners which are supposed to be L2 normalizable and which are uh, which have one of uh, so positive and negative chirality. So here E will be the vector bundle. So it's rank M complex vector bundle. Uh, over S4, but I will, so I will be uh, thinking about this equation actually on R4 with flat metric. It just that, so of course over R4 this bundle is trivial, but I want it to extend to, 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 to a bundle uh, on the sphere with this, uh, uh, with the uh, non-trivial Pantragin class. Half bundles work over S4. Say it again. Half bundles. Half bundles. It's not half bundle. No. Uh, it's not half bundle. So it's there is no, it's a vector bundle, vector bundle rank n, n is an arbitrary number, so let's not get confused. And um, so the, the, the spinners, uh, so I, I will be working on R4, so I, I, actually, I will actually pick a complex structure on R4, that's for simplicity, because, uh, 
So that it's not the, you, you have a whole two sphere of choices here, but let's just make one choice. And then you can identify the spinners with something which is simpler, namely, uh, so for me, S minus will be uh, identified with the uh, zero one forms. So it's things like DZ one bar or DZ two bar. And S plus will be identified with zero zero and zero two forms. So it's one or DZ one. And then uh, the Dirac operator under these identifications is the sum of the Dolbohr uh, differential coupled to the uh, gauge field plus is its conjugate. So D bar maps uh, zero I forms into zero I plus one forms and Z bar star acts in the opposite direction. So this is the star is with respect to Hermitian metric. So I'm identifying, uh, so, so, so here it's, I have a flat, I have a Euclidean space, and I identify it with a Hermitian um, complex vector space. So the metric will be dz1, dz1 bar plus dz2, dz2 bar where z1 and z2 are holomorphic coordinates on c2. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so the nice thing about this identification is that if you rewrite the anti-self-duality equations in terms of the complex geometry, in terms of complex geometry, this equation is equivalent to the equation that the zero two component of the curvature is equal to zero, which is equivalent to saying that the operator d bar a squares to zero. That's a fundamental equation. That's, so this is the what used to be the integrability equation, the zero curvature condition in the first approaches to, to this problem. And then the, uh, so this, this is worth two real equations. It's one complex equation. And here we have three real Lie algebra valued equations. Three is six over two. So you have uh, the rank of the space of two forms is uh, four choose two is six. And the self dual forms and other self dual two forms are three, three dimensional spaces. So this is three real, real, uh, real equations. This is worth two equations because it's one complex equation. And there's, so there's one equation missing, which is the, uh, the component of the curvature along the uh, Kähler form. So the Kähler form is So this is uh, so this equation is invariant under complexified gauge transformations. This equation is not. So sometimes people say that well, you can use this equation as to fix the non-compact part of the complex gauge transformations. So instead of imposing this equation and dividing by complex gauge uh, transformations, uh, you impose only this equation and divide by complexified gauge transformations. Uh, so. This, this correspondence is slightly subtle, but uh, in the first approximation, the space of solutions to this equation is the space of uh, anti-holomorphic connections, which have flat in the complex sense up to uh, up to uh, complexified gauge transformations. So, uh, because because of this condition, you can actually form a certain cohomology problem. And uh, this cohomology problem, so namely you look for forms which are annihilated So these are E-valued, let's say L2 normalizable E-valued 
zero comma i uh, forms, which are killed by d bar a up to up to exact forms. Uh, and now instead of so instead of dividing by by exact forms, you can impose a gauge con gauge condition on these forms, and this gauge condition will involve one one of the choices is to use the conjugate operator. So the uh, and so in the end, this problem with the gauge condition will be equivalent to solving Dirac equation. So long story short, solving the equation. Uh, so we have two choices. So either for S plus, uh, so we are looking for the, so the, the, the uh, positive chirality spinner is a sum of, of a scalar and zero to form. So let me call the scalar eta. Uh, and uh, the two form, let's say, will be called chi. Uh, so we want to impose this condition. So this equation um, takes values in uh, in zero one forms. So. Uh, So, so I'm applying t the del bar operator to the scalar, so I produce zero one form, and then I add the conjugate operator acting on chi. So that's my equation. So the, if you write this in components, you actually get two equations: d one bar eta plus, uh, let's say, d two chi equals to zero, and d two bar eta minus d one chi equals to zero. Now, uh, let's act on the first equation with d1 and the second equation with d2. So now we'll get d1, d1 bar plus d2, d2 bar acting on eta is equal to 0. Because d1 with d2 commute, that's the conjugate of the equation f0 to equals to 0. And uh, also, the, uh, the, this, the second equation, this equation, allows me to rewrite. Uh, I can simultaneously s flip the order, in this, the first term and the second term, and then in fact, I can average. So I can write this as an anti commutator. So this is the covariant Laplacian acting on eta. So these equations imply that eta is uh, covariantly harmonic, from which you conclude that eta is ac actually equals to 0. So you multiply by eta, integra integrate by parts, derive from this this eta is covariantly constant. And then, uh, because of the L2 condition, this constant will have to be 0. Otherwise, it will not be, it will not be normalizable on R4. So from this, it follows that. Uh, the Dirac equation for positive chirality spinners has no solutions. In the instant on background. On the other hand, the difference of the dimensions of the kernels. On uh, well, with my normalization this is computed by by the index theorem, which I'm sure you learned from the from uh, from lectures of Professor Zabzin, and so this is equal to k, and so this is being zero, we conclude that. 
we actually have a k-dimensional space of solutions to the Dirac equation on the space in the space of uh, uh, zero one forms. So this is k-dimensional complex vector space, which I will denote by le by the capital letter k. And now having this space, we can play with it. Uh, Namely, uh, suppose psi, psi, belongs to k, uh, psi, psi belongs to k, so it means that psi is the L2 normalizable 0, 1 form valued in the vector bundle such that uh, it solves two equations. So this is what you get by, so when you apply d bar to psi, you get zero two form, it has to vanish. And when you apply zero, uh, d bar star to psi, you get uh, zero zero form. So that's the, so the first condition is, is this uh, closeness condition, and the second condition is like a gauge for the, uh, for the identification. Um, so this is really the homology problem. And so, uh, we can do the following. We can multiply the coordinate functions on psi. So we'll produce some, uh, again, we'll get some 0, 1 form valid in the vector bundle. And um, if the, uh, well, it will not be, it will not be a solution of a drag equation but we can actually project it on the space of solutions of Dirac equation. And so we can uh, re-expand it. Uh, how to say this? Um, I will write it uh, in, in, a, in a strange form. Um, OK, I can project so P. So this is orthogonal projection. Namely, this space you can decompose and to, as a space as the as the as the kernel of Dirac operator plus the uh, uh, so let me call it H. plus h perpendicular, where it's perpendicular in the sense of the L2 norm. So L2 norm. And so if, if, you, if you like, you can form the uh, kind of Laplace operator. And so on this space, this Laplace operator will be a, uh, a strictly positive. And now you can define the projection projector by uh, one minus d slash star one of the Laplacian d slash. So what this operator does, if you act, so you act on it on on a spinner. If the spinner is annihilated by 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 Dirac operator, you'll get the spinner itself. Uh, but if it's uh, if it's not, then well, it will subtract from it some portion which is uh, which is in the space, and uh, so the if you act with Dirac operator on anything on which you acted with with this with this operator, you'll get zero. So the image of this operator is the subspace K, which we are interested in. So what we did, we, did some, we, we took, uh, so for every vector in the space k, we defined new four vectors by multiplying it by four coordinate functions and then projecting. 
And so in this way, we'll defi we've defined four complex operators. In fact, they are, so there are two complex operators and they, and they conjugate in the, by these formulas. So uh, the conclusion is that this abstract vector space k, which is Hermitian because of the L2 norm, uh, carries an action of, of four, uh, four matrices. So that's one structure. And another structure is that if you take, uh, so let's uh, look at the asymptotic behavior of, of these solutions. Uh, so, uh, so let me write psi now, psi as a, write, write in, in components. So uh, each, uh, each vector, when r goes to infinity, at infinity, the gauge field approaches the pure gauge. Um, because the uh, curvature uh, should vanish at infinity in order for the uh, an energy of the solution to be finite. And so you can approximate, approximate the Dirac operator uh, coupled to the instant gauge field uh, up to the, this gauge summation G by flat Dirac operator. And so psi should approach the solution of flat Dirac equation, which you can f find uh, in the following way. So this first equation, so we have two equations on the components of our spinner. And remember that <coughs> separately d bar and d are flat connections. So you can solve one of these equations by, let's say, writing psi alpha as d bar alpha of some chi. And then this chi will have to solve the Laplace equation. Of course, it cannot, do, it, it cannot be uh, uh, so globally, because then we will get again that uh, the solution is 0. But far away to infinity, this is, this, this, this is possible. It, you, all you need to do, you need to choose a harmonic function chi. So chi should be harmonic as r goes to infinity. And the simplest harmonic function on r4, <coughs> which is well-defined near infinity, which is rotationally symmetric, is what? What is the simplest harmonic function on R4? No, one is not good because one will give zero. So you don't want, uh, you, want you want something which is still not non-trivial. Green's function of, uh, of Laplacian. Yes, Jan knows. <laughs> no? Yes, perfect. Okay, so this is one, one possibility and uh, uh, you can multiply it by a constant vector, which I will denote, uh, I think, by i. So i, i dagger, actually. So i is going to be a map. N is the n-dimensional vector space, where, which is the fundamental representation of our gauge group. OK, so uh, let me write it here. So the possible, possible asymptotic behavior alpha as r goes to infinity behaves either as d alpha bar 1 over r squared. And this d is really just its usual d dressed with the flat, flat uh, gauge transformation, uh, with, uh, with gauge transformation. Uh, so it's i dagger. And the second option is to write epsilon alpha beta again 1 over r squared times j. So i and j are constant. 
So i is the map from n to k, and j is the map from k to n. So what I wrote here is a kind of a fundamental solution. So it's a uh, so, so the psi has two labels. Psi is valued in the n-dimensional vector space, that which, which I use uh, denoted by E, so the, the fiber of the vector bundle. And also psi is valued in k because uh, we have k solutions. So k. And so that's the neat way of packaging this. So, uh, so by investigate by looking at the solutions of Dirac equation, we required the following algebraic structure. We have a vector space k. K and n. And we have maps uh, i and j. And we have the operators b1 and b2, which act on k. And, and the Hermitian conjugates. Now, uh, when you multiply coordinate functions on anything, of course, these operations commute. You can multiply them in, a, um, in arbitrary order. But here, after we multiply it, we project it. And so after you project, what used to be commuting doesn't commute uh, anymore. So this is, of course, well known, well f should be familiar from the studies of the quantum Hall effect, where the co coordinates on a two-dimensional plane where the, where the electron moves, electrons move become non-commutative coordinates when you project in the first Landau level. So this is exactly what, what's going on here, except that it's in four dimensions. So the matrices B1, B2 do not commute in general. But what's remarkable, and that's been shown by Corrigan and Goddard, was that the commutation relation between B1 and B2 close, close up to the matrices I and J. So the only thing which you need to know is this quadruple this quiver, uh, which you can summarize in the quiver diagram in modern notations. So this is i, this is j. This is b1 and b2. And so it, it is a computation which is uh, straightforward but rather long to show that the commutator of b1 and b2 fails to be zero by, the, by this uh, finite rank matrix ij. And then the commutator of b1 with b1 dagger plus b2 And this is uh, modular, the uh, choices of basis in this, in this k-dimensional vector space. It, we, we didn't have any specified basis, so we can, we're allowed to um, conjugate the matrices b1, b2, and multiply i on the left and j on the right. So, uh, so on one hand, from the instanton data, you produce these matrices, which solve these equations. These are called the DHM equations. And they have uh, the hyperkeller meaning. So this is, these are hyperkeller moment maps. In some sense, they are kind of infinite dimensional Fourier transforms of the equations f0 2 equals to 0 and f11 omega a equals to 0. So this is the analog of the first equation, and this is the analog of the second equation. And this analogy is actually helpful in designing the integration formulas. Now, uh, so, we, I so I described how, given A, you produce B1, B2, I, and J. There is, a, there is an inverse construction, which is actually the ADHM construction, which is uh, given the solution of these equations, you can produce the gauge field and you can also produce the solutions of Dirac equation. So this is uh, uh, done as follows. So you consider now, again, kind of a Dirac operator, which will be acting from k tensor uh, c squared plus n 
this space. So explicitly this is this rectangular matrix. It's easy to remember how to construct it. So first you go B1, B2, and I. And then here you take the Hermitian conjugate of, of this guy with a minus sign, Hermitian conjugate of this guy, and minus J dagger. Uh, the property of this map, so it's a family of maps which are parameterized by, by, uh, by, by point on C2. So for each point on, uh, on our space, this is going to be our space R4, we have a linear operator. In other words, you have a family, you have a vector bundle, you have two vector bundles with these uh, fibers over R4, they're trivial bundles, but then you have a map, bundle map, which depends, which is, uh, which depends on where you are. And uh, this map has an interesting, has a nice property that uh, if you look at, at its conjugate, And so compute the, the product. So this is going to be a map from uh, k tensor c squared to k tensor c squared. Well, when you compute it and use the DHM equations, you'll find that this map actually commutes, so it's, it's actually identity on C squared uh, times some map on, on K. So this is uh, delta tensor one on C squared, where delta is a, uh, it's a Hermitian operator on K, uh, which is non-negative. And then one actually imposes certain non-singularity non condition on the ADHM data, which guarantees that this operator is strictly positive. So delta is strictly positive for good quadruples of matrices. And then uh, the original vector bundle E is recovered as the kernel of this map. So you see, uh, what I'm doing, I'm taking the, doing the following. I take first the trivial vector bundle with the fiber n, and then add to it something, and then map the result to, to the, same, the same vector bundle. So I'm trying to uh, add some redundant data, but then I'm, my, I'm, I'm twisting the isomorphism in a way which depends on z. And so uh, the kernel of this operator is my vector bundle, and the connection is just a projection, it's just a projected connection. So it's uh, where, uh, so you solve these equations, and psi is just an identifi uh, identifier. So psi is the map from n to the space. So you solve, you solve this equ the equation d dagger psi is equal to 0. You can write it again explicitly in this form. So and then you just differentiate and, and project. And so, and the claim is that this is the, the solves the Inzaton equations. And moreover, the claim is that that gives all solutions. So if you repeat this procedure twice, so start with B, I, and J, produce A, look at the solutions of Dirac equation. So the Dirac equation is solved by in this very explicit form. Uh, so look at the solution of Dirac equations and recover the operators B1, B2, I, and J. You'll get 
what you start with up to maybe UK transformation. So that's the claim. Okay, so this is nice. The infinite dimensional, the, the PD problem is, is reduced to the algebraic problem. So let's see how can we use it. So we are interested in, in computing the path integral. And uh, the simplest path integral which one can compute is that of in the context of n equals 2 d equals 4 superannual theory. Um, so it has uh, eight supercharges, of which I will single out one supercharge, call its action delta, and so it acts on the gauge field produces something which I will call psi m. So this is twisted green. No, it's twisted in the same sense in, the, in, in, the, in which I replaced spinners by uh, forms uh, previously. Um, I'm working on R4. So actually, I'm not doing anything to my theory, just using more mathematical notation, if you like. and. Uh, so the variation of the fermion is the covariant derivative of the scalar. So the field content of n equals 2 minimal, minimal theory, minimal supernumerals is uh, you have a gauge field and you have a complex scalar in that joint. And it's conjugate. And the fermions, these notations, correlate with what I did used for, for my spinners before. So this is uh, one form. This is a scalar. And this is self-dual two form. It's all adjoint valued, and these are fermions. But sorry, why do you say you don't do anything? This is written topological uh, as well. And I'm not making my theory topological like this. So, well, if you like, uh, super, super, super symmetric theories in general on flat spaces have topological subsectors. You're not making a theory topological. You're, making, you, you, you're defining a, a subset of operators which are topological in a certain sense, uh, but that's always the case. So, with the super symmetric word identities, which, said, which say that the Hamiltonian is the commutator of the supercharge, imply that if something is annihilated by the supercharge, the expectation, the correlation functions don't depend on time. Of these things. Um, all right. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, things like uh, sigma bar varies into eta. This is on shell. This is after some auxiliary field has been integrated out. And so the whole action of the super annuals can be written as a sum of the topological term. Uh, I'm, again, I'm skipping the, the factors of 2 pi plus delta of uh, chi plus times f plus. Uh, well, maybe I should write them auxiliary field here. So this is the auxiliary bosonic field. Plus, uh, plus psi D star uh. okay so <laughs> if you when you compute the delta variation of the of, of the right hand side and then you integrate out the field H you'll recover the standard superannual section written in a slightly different not not notation for the fermions but it's like identical to the standard action so tau here is uh, 
is a complex combination of the theta angle and the angular coupling. So, uh, right, uh, the reason I wrote this is that you can actually write the parallel uh, multiplet, similar multiplet for, for, for the five dimensional model of the instanton moduli space. So, here the point is that, that the uh, localization in this path integral on the locus of, of fields which are uh, uh, fixed by delta will reduce the infinite dimensional path integral to the integral over the finite dimensional modular space of instantons. So delta localization gives you the integral over the modular space of instantons. And that's finite dimensional space. Yes, I, I should have said that. Uh, just like a computer index for a drug operator coupled to the uh, uh, fundamental valued uh, spinners, you can also com you can also compute it for the adjoint valued spinners, and that will compute the tangent, uh, the virtual um, uh, dimension of the mo of the modulus space solution to this equation, which happens to be the actual dimension, which is matched by the, uh, of course, well, it matched by the um, dimension of this five dimensional space you get from matrices. So that space. has uh, a real dimension for nk. So uh, you have uh, four k by k matrices, and you have two uh, complex k by n matrices. And now these four k by k matrices are killed by uh, imposing three equations and dividing by the group uk. And so that's the, 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 the number of degrees of freedom you are left with. So that's the, the modular space. So now you can, instead of studying the infinite dimensional problem, you can do the similar finite dimensional problem where, where you would introduce the super partners for, the, for these matrices and then for the uh, uh, corresponding multiplet for the, um, for the UK gauge symmetry. And so you can compute the same integral uh, using the finite dimensional model. But of course, uh, it's going to be something kind of ill-defined because the, uh, actually this modular space is non-compact. And if you naively compactify it, it's singular. So these integrals by themselves are not very well defined. Uh, what we're interested in, in gauge theory, actually, we, it's not in computing the partition function per se. Uh, we want to fix the asymptotic value of the uh, scalar sigma, so which is again you can it's allowed to have non-zero again non-zero non expectation value because uh, as long as it computes with its conjugate and uh, compute the effective action for the small for the small fluctuations around around this 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 configuration uh, and so the effective action will also be n equals two supersymmetric. So you can write it in uh, also in a way in s uh, as a sum of something topological and uh, delta exact. But uh, now the uh, the coupling tau will start depending on the expectation value of this field sigma. So instead of the uh, SUN gauge group, when you expand your theory around the configuration where this, this field sigma has generic expectation value, you only see the maximal torus as a gauge group. So instead of the uh, SUN valued uh, gauge field, you will now have uh, the maximal torus valued one. And so uh, now the gauge symmetry is less restrictive and supersymmetry allows more general couplings where you, where the curvatures of different uh, gauge fields are coupled to the scalars through some matrix valued interaction. Plus, uh, and then supersymmetry tells you that this has to be completed. So there are 
uh, further terms, like uh, the derivative with respect to AK, tau IJ, and then there is something like psi, uh, uh, psi K wedge psi I wedge FJ plus, uh, so this is maybe two thirds, maybe one third, maybe this is one fourth second derivative uh, AK AL tau J, and then there are four fermions psi, 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 I, J, K, L. And then when you look at the symmetry structure of this, uh, of the various couplings, you conclude that this, the, the coefficients have to be completely symmetric. So tau actually should come from some prepotential, which should be a locally holomorphic function of A. And so determining this function is equivalent to determining the, the uh, effective action at least up to delta exact terms. But then, remember, we singled out arbitrarily one supercharge, which was nilpotent, out of eight. So you can do repeat this exercise for different choices of supercharges, and then cons requiring the consistency of the structure will fix the, f the, uh, the effective action at the level of two derivatives and four fermions, all in terms of this single function. So it's this function which you want to compute. And now this function you can compute by designing a, a trick which is uh, to deform the original theory in such a way that uh, instead of the integral of the moduli space of all instantons, you'll be uh, dealing with the uh, localized version of this integral where it's, uh, it is saturated by contribution of some uh, special instanton configurations Fixed, the fixed points of, of certain symmetry. And so that's, the, that's what omega deformation does. So I'm, I'm deforming, uh, sorry. So the idea is to recognize in this differential, in this uh, supercharge, the equivariant differential equivalent drum differential acting on the space of, of gauge fields, which is equivalent with respect to the action of the gauge group. Uh, now, in, in gauge theory, the gauge group is something we divide by, so it's not a symmetry, it's, it's a redundancy. But we can uh, slightly um, uh, help ourselves by saying that when we fix the ex vacuum expectation value of the gauge field, of the scalar, it actually means that we single out, singled out uh, a subgroup of constant gauge transformations uh, and we fix it as a global group. So we decide, we will not divide by it, we only divide by gauge transformations which vanish at infinity. And so we can separate sigma into the part which vanishes at infinity plus something which will be the expectation value. So this guy goes to zero as r goes to infinity and this is, this will be uh, keeping fixed. Uh, and now uh, we can think of another global symmetry group which we can use to our advantage which will deform th the supercharge. And that's, that symmetry group is a group of rotations. So I'm just, so if, w what follows is you, if you like it, it, you can view it as a kind of regularization of the theory. So in the end we will be interested in removing this regularization, at least for the pur purposes of the computing the effective action. So I'm deforming delta to delta with parameters epsilon. So these are the uh, parameters of the infinitesimal Uh, SO4 rotation of R4. So this is where my twisted notation comes handy because uh, if, you, if you want to do the same in uh, untwisted language, then you, uh, you'll have to say that 
In addition to the R4 rotation, you also do the SU2 R symmetry rotation, which will preserve par part of the supercharges. So, okay, so this delta epsilon acts on the gauge field in, this, in the old way, but the fermion now, uh, let me skip the indices. So, okay, so it used to be given by the covariant derivative of, of sigma, and now I'm adding a new term, which is the contraction of the curvature of, of the gauge field A with the uh, rotational vector field. So V epsilon is epsilon 1 uh, Z1 d by dz1 minus Z1 bar. plus epsilon 2 uh, I should stress here that uh, just as with gauge transformations the actual gauge transformations are uh, uh, generated by uh, anti-emission matrices the supersymmetry algebra contains the complexified parameters of, of the transformations. Uh, and so here, the parameters epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are complex parameters, and in fact, the story is holomorphic in them, even though the actual rotation of space-time is generated by the vector fields when epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are real. And uh, finally, uh, d epsilon of sigma now is the contraction of psi with, with v. Uh, so it used to be that uh, any function, any gauge invariant function of sigma was delta closed, and so that gave rise to the uh, Kyle ring of uh, local operators which were built out of sigma, which you can ins could insert everywhere in spacetime. Now this is no longer possible. Once epsilon is in place, if your operator sits somewhere away from uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the origin of my rotation, it is no longer supersymmetric. So the only, so now the cohomology of this uh, supercharged delta, so delta squared is equal to zero up to rotation and gauge and global. symmetries. Um, so the only operators which are annihilated by delta these are the func uh, the, so these are the gauge invariant functions of sigma inserted at the origin. So this is where z is equal to zero. So now so, th so the cohomology has been reduced so to speak. Uh, it actually has not been reduced in size because previously, even though it looked like you could insert an operator of sig a function of sigma at any point in space time, if you move that point, you didn't get new homology. It was, is what the result was uh, homologous uh, to the previous one. So, uh, and so in particular, you could, you could move everything which you liked to the origin of space time. And so this is where this cohomology sits. So the cohomology actually didn't change in size, but it, uh, it's changed in, in kind of even representation. Uh, now you can ask whether, so I deform the supercharge, but of course I want my theory to be invariant on this deformed supercharge. And so I need to modify the action in, uh, in, uh, in the epsilon dependent way. But as its notation suggests, it's a small deformation. So in the end, we can ta take, take epsilon to zero and recover the um, original theory. Uh, now the advantage is that, that we no longer have kind of propagating fields which will spoil the, uh, the, well, the, um, you know, the, 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 the integrating, uh, the Wilsonian integration procedure. So here in the, in, in, the, in the standard approach, you cannot integrate out all the fields in your theory because you, you have massless fields which you cannot integrate out. When you're trying to integrate them out, you get infrared divergences. Now, with the epsilon deformation, with the omega deformation in place, you can integrate out everything except for the zero modes of sigma. And so that's what we will do. Uh, 
And so in particular, you can, uh, uh, so if you first reduce onto the module space of instantons and look at the expression at the differential form which the path integral measure will produce here, well, it will produce something like uh, uh, exponential of delta of uh, psi Um, okay, how should I write this? So, uh, you see, uh, the group, the, the rotational symmetries of R4 act on, on this uh, B i and j data, namely the rotation generated by epsilon 1 epsilon 2 uh, acts uh, well simply multiplies uh, b1 by phase b2 by phase and j by the product of these phases. So you can check that these equations are covariant under these transformations. And so uh, it means that to every, so, so I have a vector field with parameters epsilon. So it's a vector field on, on the modular space of instantons which uh, for real epsilon would be even an isometry. And now, if, so if G denotes a metric which comes from, uh, so it descends from from a two metric on, 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 on gauge fields. So it's an integral over a four trace delta a mu squared with some choice of gauge. Say it again. It's a hypercarrier, yes, hypercarrier. Uh, so now if I substitute the vector field V with the parameter which I will call uh, epsilon bar into the metric, that defines, so it gives me one form on the modular space. So in, in components, this is G M N V M epsilon bar D X N. And uh, so I can, so I have the same, I have a similar d differential delta epsilon which acts on differential form, equivalent differential forms on M plus. And so I can use this differential to produce an integration measure on M plus. This form. So this is uh, so this you can trace. So you can you can uh, trace to the original omega deformed n equals two action. And now, by the usual tricks, so if you send epsilon bar to infinity, the answer doesn't change since it's delta exact. This is equal to the sum over the fixed points of uh, rotational symmetry. One over the product of the weights so at each fixed point, you look at the tangent space. So 
P is in in the modular space, which is uh, so. This is where the vector field vanishes. It preserves the point, but it acts on the tangent space. So this tangent space becomes a representation of the rotational group. Uh, if you like the derivatives, so this is like so this is an upper. It's, it's like a matrix uh, which depends linearly on epsilon. It's the matrix which acts in the tangent space, and you take its eigenvalues. So this is the so eigenvalues. It's just a determinant of this matrix, basically. So this is what you put in, in denominator. I get a can ask, do you send epsilon bar to infinity? Yes. Or you put a sum and keep in epsilon fixed? Yes. yes. This is just a way to compute this integral. Uh, All right, but you can also put a real parameter in front and send it, uh, I mean, formally to give you... What's the difference? Epsilon, epsilon, it's linear in epsilon bar. I mean, certain equations will decouple. I mean, equation d sigma plus iv epsilon bar f will decouple if you send This is epsilon. This is not epsilon bar. This is not epsilon bar. It's, this is epsilon. Right, this is finite. Right. It's only here that you send epsilon bar to infinity. I didn't, I didn't write the full delta differential, so you didn't see where epsilon right, bar But is. you look at these things times complex conjugate, right? I mean, not, not, not if epsilon epsilon bar are not... Uh, so once epsilon bar becomes independent of epsilon, they're not complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. Right, but what I'm trying to say that when you send epsilon bar to infinity, yes. you will send a real parameter in front of infinity, you will get slightly different conditions. Uh, one will be stronger. What you are going, you are going for stronger. So I'm asking. Maybe yes. But, uh, uh, whatever works. So I will arrive. Uh, so I will arrive at, at, at this. Uh, Result, except that unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, this modular space is not is not a space at which this uh, rotational symmetry has isolated fixed points with well-defined tangent space, and so this is where we need to do a couple more tricks. Uh, so further, <coughs> regularization. Okay, Google. We introduced the Fairopoulos term. Uh, so, so at this point, this looks completely arbitrary. Uh, uh, but and, and I don't have time to explain what it really means. But so once you make this uh, deformation, which is, in some sense, it's a delta exact deformation. But the outcome is is drastic. So instead of the space which has some conical singularities, you now we'll get a space which is smooth. And now what used to be a kind of a bad point where the instantons uh, were point-like and sitting on top of each other is now getting resolved into a multi-dimensional space on which the, the <coughs> rotational symmetry actually acts with isolated fixed points. So in this picture, well, so you, you had uh, so this is the, the simplest model where you had, a, let's say, a one singularity. And then by, by introducing zeta, this a one singularity gets replaced by, by a small two sphere. And then the rotational symmetry acts in, uh, well, acts everywhere except in, 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 in particular on this two sphere with two isolated fixed points, and so each fixed point now has a tangent space on which you can compute this quantity. Here, the, the parameter zeta, which I introduced, doesn't, doesn't appear here. So you can formally say, well, you can send zeta to zero, and uh, the, the answer will be still the same, except that you, you will not have an interpretation of the individual term. So when zeta is non-zero, you can actually make sense out of each term separately. But when zeta is zero, only the whole sum makes some sense. Uh, okay, so uh, what are these fixed points? Let's uh, let's do a little bit of algebra. Uh, 
maybe I should say something about what happens to these equations when you introduce zeta. So what, what does it really mean algebraically? So suppose zeta is positive, then I claim that these equations are equivalent to the following equations. But first of all, well, you keep the first equation. It doesn't change. And the second equation we replace by the stability condition, which says that uh, <coughs> When you, so you have this operator i, which maps n to k. So you, if I apply i to n, I get a subspace in k, on which I can further act with matrices b1 and b2 in arbitrary order. So I act with all polynomials in b1, b2. They are not commuting in general, so, but I, I, don't, I don't fear that. And the conditions that when you act with all possible combinations of b1 and b2 on the image of n, that should generate all of the space k. So that's the stability condition. So I claim that this is equivalent to imposing the second equation and dividing by the group uk. In, in this way of formulating things, I can divide by the group glk. So it acts on... Um, That's the way it acts on these matrices. So here, I'm, there is no uh, complex conjugation involved. So everything is holomorphic. Uh, it's a neat exercise to prove that stability is equivalent to that, uh, but I don't have time to, to do this. Um, now, uh, the fixed points. So let me introduce the parameters of rotation, so T1. It's like e to the epsilon 1, t2 is e to the epsilon 2. And uh, let me use uh, the matrix B So this is the second, so the, the group, so these are, this will be the uh, uh, group elements of the maximal torus of the global symmetry group. And so these guys act on my EDHM data. In this way, uh, I be inverse T1, T2, B, J. Okay? So, what, what does it mean to have a fixed point? It means that you look at for a quadruple b1, b2, i, and j, such that this is equivalent to, to that up to the, the transformation of the symmetry group. So to, to be at a fixed point, it means that you, for each t1, t2, and b, you find the compensating transformation compensator H, which depends on T1, T2, and B, such that this is equal to uh, what I, so H, T1, T2, B, acting on B1, B2, I, and J. Okay, so, well, so T1, B1 is equal to H inverse B1, H. T2, B2 is H inverse B to H, uh, I B inverse is equal to H inverse I, and T1 T2 B J is equal to J H. Very good. So let's classify the solutions of this equation, provided with provide provided B1 B2, provided that we solve this equation, and the, we have a stability condition. Okay, well, first of all, uh, 
our space n splits as a sum of the uh, so these are eigenspaces okay, so it's an eigenspace of b with the eigenvalue is the a alpha so these are one dimensional spaces for generic choices of a's and now I have a vector i alpha which is the image of i and now uh, this equation says that h acting on i alpha is equal to b alpha on i alpha let me call it b alpha so uh, this matrix h has eigenvectors we, we already know n of its eigenvectors with its eigenvalues and moreover if I act with some polynomial let's say binomial of b1 and b2 on the vector i alpha so let me call this vector i j alpha it is an eigenvector of h with the eigenvalue b alpha t1 to the power i minus 1 t2 to the power j minus 1 right so this is you use these equations to see to show that when you act with b1 you raise the eigenvalue of h by uh, uh, the eigenvalue is multiplied by t1 or by b by t2 depending on, on, on these things and uh, finally so uh, okay so so what you see you see that the, these vectors which uh, should span the, ve the vector space k So here I'm, I'm not yet careful about the ordering, the ordering might matter, but uh, irrespective of how you order the matrices, the eigenvalue will be the same. Uh, and this, so for generic T1, T2, and B, these are different eigenvalues, so these vectors cannot be linearly dependent for different uh, i, j, and alpha. Um, right, so, so the eigenvalues have this form, they, 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 uh, they grow if you take a logarithm, so they have the form epsilon alpha, a alpha plus epsilon one. So they grow into some kind of lattice way uh, with certain uh, preferred direction. So the direction is given by the vectors epsilon one, epsilon two. On the other hand, the the operator j, if you look carefully at, at, at uh, what, what's written here, if I didn't make a crucial mistake, which I might, might have, uh, would want to have an eigenvalue which grows in a different direction. And so from this you actually conclude pretty fast that, that I with J vanishes on all these vectors. So, uh, okay. Uh, so actually J vanishes on K and B1, B2 commute and uh, the structure of this solution is such that the space K splits into the sum of uh, N subspaces and each subspace has a structure of Young diagram where you uh, so where the, the box with the coordinates i and j and uh, so the block number alpha is this factor here. And so the fixed points are uh, antiples of uh, Young diagrams of total size equals to k. So the total number of vectors, so each block is, 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 the, uh, is a basis vector and the total number of vectors is equal to k. So that's the, that's the condition. And then uh, the uh, algebraic calculation is to calculate the, uh, the, um, the linearization of the, of the symmetry 
transformations on the tangent space at such a fixed point. So, so instead of, so once you found such B1, B2, I and J, which is, uh, which I just, just described, I described this as complex operators. So B1 acts uh, by moving from, from one box to the right and B2 acts by moving this box uh, one step up until you get out of the Young diagram where it becomes zero. So then, what you need to look at, you need to look at the variations of of B, which should solve the linearized equation up to linear linearization of the symmetry. And uh, so, on this linearized. Uh, uh, so, so on, on this linearization, you act <coughs> with a symmetry group, namely, you uh, so t1, t2, b act in the following way. Well, first of all, there is this naive transformation, which is what you you did, and then but then you compensate. with the same compensator H, which you had before. So uh, the, I, so delta I uh, B inverse H, T1, T2 B delta J H inverse. So the idea is that uh, uh, on the space of all matrices, you acted simultaneously with the uh, with the fixed global symmetry transformation T1, T2B, and then you compensated by H, which was designed in such a way that that quadruple was kept intact. That was so it was fixed not as a orbit but as actual rep representative. And so then for the nearby matrix, which is B plus delta B you act with this combination of the symmetry, global symmetry and local symmetry. And uh, so when you undo this, uh, this is going to be B1 plus, plus what I wrote here. So this is now expli it's an explicit linear transformation of these variations. And you need to find the eigenvalues. And so these eigenvalues will be the, uh, the, the generalized arm leg formula, which uh, you get into the denominator. And then, uh, in this way, you produce the partition function, the case of the contribution to the partition function, and you sum them up, and then explore the limit epsilon goes to 0. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I, I, I didn't get far. Um, one, OK, let me just make one maybe remark, which is kind of a beginning of an of a interesting story, is that in this analysis, I assumed that my parameters were generic. So there was no relation, there was no accidental relation between these eigenvalues. So this, all these factors were forced to be linearly independent because the eigenvalues were different. Uh, nevertheless, uh, sometimes one is forced to consider non-generic values of parameters. And in particular, uh, if uh, epsilon 1 over epsilon 2 is a rational number, and it's a positive rational number, then, uh, well, you see, it means that, uh, so epsilon 1 times i minus 1 plus epsilon 2 times j minus 1 is some epsilon times, let's say, p. So you have a bunch of integers. And it may happen that for different i and j, you get, you get identical eigenvalues. <laughs> and so what it means, it, what it amounts to is that these fixed points are no longer isolated. So they are non-isolated. And so. In this localization formula, which I erased, which was a sum of, uh, of uh, fixed points with some denominators, these denominators will vanish. 
And so the individual contribution will be infinite, and so the formula will not make sense. However, uh, if you can prove that the set of fixed points, even though not isolated, is compact, then that will guarantee that, well, the, the, the formula will be slightly more complicated, but it will be still finite. The limit will be finite. And so the limit exists. Uh, this is important because uh, if you are not doing this uh, as a, the way I did when I, I mean, my epsilons were at my disposal, but you try to find the, these uh, uh, supercharges, the way these supercharges act as a specific supergravity backgrounds, then sometimes the values of epsilons are fixed for you by, by supergravity. And so in the in this later work by uh, uh, Peston, for example, when he computed the partition function of uh, n equals 4 on S4, the epsilons which he got were equal. So he could not use literally my formula because uh, individual contributions contained things like epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. And so you, you, they, they literally, they, they, the expression is infinite. Uh, and so the actual formula is more complicated because then you, it, uh, instead of the points, you have now some sub sub varieties in the, in the Hilbert scheme of points, of, of which are uh, compact but uh, uh, complicated. <coughs> but uh, anyway, so this compactness, it's, uh, this is the beginning of the story of compactness theorems on the modular space of instantons and the modifications which lead to various uh, uh, powerful uh, worried entities and Dyson Schwinger formulas uh, from which one can derive most of the of what is known about the relation of this story to uh, conformal field theories and the could deformations. Uh, so I apologize for not covering all the material, but uh, well you, you you might have access to the notes and try to, to, <laughs> to learn from there. Thank you. <laughs>